Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. And uh, we are waiting for our attendees to join. And we'll be starting in a few minutes. So, hope I'm audible to the attendees. Could you just write down or Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, uh, before we start, uh, we would want to know our audience better. So we have uh, two poll questions, which uh, pages will launch in some time. And if you can let us know <coughs> that if you're an entrepreneur wanting to enter the climatic space, or if you have some, if you are someone who has explored the carbon markets, um, can just, uh, it's a yes or no, yes or no question. If we just click. So that it's helpful for us to know our audience. All right. Thanks, Tejas. Great. So we have the polls. Uh, so we have 67% saying yes, uh, we are an aspiring entrepreneur, want to start our career in the climate tech space. And uh, even uh, being in the carbon market, we do have some less entries. So 71% uh, says that they have not been in the carbon market, which shows that uh, there, there is interest in the carbon market because we see a lot of attendees attending the session. Uh, we have 28% saying that we have been in the carbon markets. So they have experience in being the carbon markets. We'll continue with our poll questions later on as well. But for now, I would like to start the session. And before, uh, we'll be introducing our speakers uh, for today. But before that, I would request Zoe, uh, partner at Climate Collective, to introduce Climate Collective to us for those who of uh, as uh, those, those of you who are not aware of Climate Collective, uh, we can speak on that and uh, she can talk about our latest programs and launches. So uh, if it's of interest to you, please uh, keep in touch with you. We'll be posting the required links on the chat. So please have a look at the chat and get to know more about us. So over to you, Zoe. Great. Thanks, Pauline. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session. Um, it's quite exciting to see so many people attending these carbon market sessions. Um, and for those who have already attended one uh, during the week, welcome back to the second one um, with our uh, speakers today, uh, who I'll let follow me introduce later. Uh, but for those who are new to the Climate Collective community, uh, I would just like to introduce quickly um uh, what we do and our organization uh so we are a non-profit and uh, we work in the niche of climate tech entrepreneurship support uh so i see on the chat somebody had already posted that hey we are not aspiring entrepreneurs but we are already an entrepreneur in the climate tech space 
so that's exactly the audience that we work with. Um, we have been in this space active since six years, um, and we have supported more than 860 plus climate tech startups till date across South Asia. Uh, when we say climate tech, it's much broader. It's energy, mobility, even waste, plastic wastes, um, pollution startups, food resilience, um, et cetera. Uh, we've run more than 60 plus acceleration programs. Um, and we have a presence across um, India, of course, but Sri Lanka, Maldives, um, the UAE, uh, a little bit in Africa as well. Um, I'll come to the support focus that we have, but uh, rather than just running accelerators, we also do, um, we, we look at ourselves as ecosystem enablers and ecosystem developers. Uh, so we do a lot more um, activities um, in making sure that we have a thriving climate. <laughs> And we can proudly say that we are the largest early stage climate tech um, startup acceleration platform in South Asia and big plans to go uh, across the entire global south. In fact, just today we have launched our accelerator program called the Climate Accelerator. So do check it out on our pages on LinkedIn if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to quickly go through these pillars uh, that are our main pillars across uh, Climate Collective. Uh, the second pillar, which I've been talking about, are acceleration programs, and we do this for across startup stages. Um, with uh, what I mean by acceleration is that we support startups by mentoring them, training them. Uh, we do a lot of investor connects, uh, pilot. Uh, we, we facilitate pilot projects and corporate connects. Uh, we also have our own industry decarbonization platform where we work with corporates uh, to decarbonize their supply chains. Um, going, uh, uh, you know, going a, a step uh, before, uh, we also uh, want to support aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, and so we have entrepreneurship development programs, particularly our climate startup school. Um, you can see the link in the chat. Uh, we have been running these programs specifically for women, but now we have uh, courses for uh, anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur in the space, whether you're a working professional, uh, you're a student or you're, you're a young graduate exploring career opportunities. Uh, we have our own capital platforms uh, further on uh, to support you in your entrepreneurial journey. And these uh, capital platforms are tailored to different sizes and uh, stages of startup. Um, and we, uh, of course, have a large community with all the work that we do. Um, and Climate Startup Week that we are in right now um, is one big event that we run. Uh, but apart from that, we also run other events as a part of our community, like the Climate Tech Investment Summit that's coming up in April. Um, and we also run various other masterclasses on impact, um, on business uh, development, etc. Um, so, so do check out our platforms, particularly the capital platforms. If you're interested, we have a grants platform, we have Cedars Club. So if you're also uh, looking to be an investor in the space or, uh, or is a startup looking to raise capital in early stages, um, our Climate Cedars Club and Climate Tech Investment Network are uh, very good platforms for you to, um, you know, find avenues to raise money. Um, I've already spoken about this, but climatestartupschool.com, um, check out our offerings as well as our fellowships, which are currently live in climate change and circular economy. Um, uh, the, the link is on the chat. Um, these are the domains that we work with, and we're very excited about the session today because it goes just beyond carbon markets and also talks about water credits, uh, plastic credits, because so many of our startups are in these domains. Um, and so we keep getting requests that please uh, help us with all of these new terms, SDG credits, and how do they work. Um, and so um, we're, we're very, very excited about this session. Uh, very quickly, some of our key partnerships have been the EIT Climate Kick that we've been working with the European Union body. Uh, we also uh, work with New Energy Nexus uh, when it comes to the energy programs. Uh, we're supported by the government, DST, MOFCC, et cetera. And we've run multiple programs with um, these as implementation partners, 
like with UNDP, uh, CDC group, uh, we ran the India Plastic Challenge with MOFCC. Uh, we've been supported by the Australian government for our angel network, um, as well as another program in the Maldives. Uh, we've been working with GIZ, et cetera. Uh, we have a lovely team of about uh, 35 uh, people and growing, um, and some of us uh, are on the session today. Uh, please feel free to contact us, um, and uh, we are here for any of your queries. If you are interested in the climate tech space, already in the climate tech space, or want to invest in the climate tech space. Uh, so thank you so much for listening, um, and uh, we hope that we're all part of the community which is growing and thriving. Um, great. So over to you, follow me to start introducing our speakers and to kickstart the session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Zui. So that said, uh, we would like to introduce our speakers, uh, Mr. Kishore Bhutani from Universal Carbon Registry. Uh, Kishore is the head of program policy and partnerships at uh, Universal Carbon Registry and has more than 20 years of experience in carbon markets and has developed carbon offset projects from India in the voluntary carbon space. His portfolio includes uh, wind hydro methane and landfill methane capture projects. And regarding UCR, we would like to know, uh, like you to know that UCR is the first and the largest Indian carbon standard and registry, uh, which has a simple, fast and scalable protocol to facilitate uh, mining of voluntary carbon credits from green projects. For today's session, Kishore would be speaking on the UCR protocol and standards, carbon credits with respect to the protocol, as well as uh, newer concepts that are coming in the space, such as water credits and SDG credits. So welcome, Kishore. Uh, we also have Anirban Chatterjee from RTI International. RTI is, uh, as you some of you may know, is an independent non-profit research institute. Anirban has 14 uh, plus years of experience in developing partnerships and shared value-led business transformation strategies in the field of environmental sustainability and climate change with specific focus on resource efficiency and circularity. In the context of solid waste and plastics, he has also assisted state governments in the past uh, in optimizing municipal solid waste flows and has also helped FMCG brands in developing their EPR strategies. Uh, for today's session, Anirban would be taking the uh, plastic credits. Uh, he would be speaking on plastic credits. So welcome again, uh, speakers. Uh, I would now like to hand it over to Kishore. Yeah, uh, so Yash, uh, could you just say, share the PPT? All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Climate Collective and team. Uh, thanks, Palomi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, we have a fruitful session today. Uh, my brief will initially last for, I guess, 10 minutes and then uh, we shall be opening it up for questions after, I guess, Anibar, Anibar is done with his uh, plastic credit initiative. So very briefly, uh, Universal Carbon Registry, as we call it, uh, UCR. Uh, again, all these questions that are popping up, we will take it to uh, the end uh, at the end of the Q&A session or towards the Q&A session. So UCR uh, is short for Universal Carbon Registry. The standard right so the stand is what that for qualify um, for your carbon credit. sure uh, sorry to interrupt your voice is breaking up so if you can switch off the video i uh, think uh, all right yeah. is this better yeah 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 Take okay. it. all right so uh the ucr standard for carbon sets the parameters for eligibility requirements into the program the registry is something that you can look at as a NSDL, right? If you all have ever done stock trading, NSDL is where all your stocks are stored. So essentially, the registry keeps a track of all your carbon credits, uh, what you do with the carbon credits, whether you sell it, whether you transfer it, whether you retire it. So essentially, that is the function of a typical registry. So what is very important is, all you entrepreneurs and uh, would-be entrepreneurs and those who are already active, you already know that uh, each, each standard has its own eligibility requirements for uh, earning carbon credits. So I would suggest uh, heading over to our website, which is ucarbonregistry.io 
and download the latest updated standard and then have a look at uh, what project types are eligible. Uh, almost all projects from uh, developing countries are eligible at this point. Uh, if you're part of uh, what we call the Global North or Annex One Nations, then obviously you're not allowed to earn carbon offsets unless, unless you're coming out with a really breakthrough technology that we have not yet seen in the developing world. Uh, so if you're coming with a wind, solar or hydro project in the developing world, uh, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, Brazil, all the BRIC nations, including somebody asked Philippines, you all, all are eligible naturally because we are all part of the global south. So the global south is where you generate your credits from. And the global north is the nations that are supposed to buy these credits. Now, please remember that UCR is a voluntary carbon standard. Voluntary is the key word here. Uh, I know that there was a session on carbon credits done earlier in the week. So they would have naturally covered the differences between the voluntary and the compliance market. Uh, the good news right now is that everything is mainstream, climate change, sustainability, carbon credits, ESG, it's all in the mainstream right now. It is a very good time to enter this space, especially, uh, you know, those coming from the tech background. We also are seeing a lot of uh, climate action and carbon credits and uh, all different types of new biodiversity credits being created, being taken on chain on the blockchain space. Uh, so it's it's a good time where we are seeing climate action and tech merge completely. Of course, uh, they're still in the early stages where we don't really know what kind of utility is being added or value addition is being done on chain, but that will surely change uh, in the next few years. Um, the bad news is the IPCC report that came out recently, just last week, that uh, the next 10 years uh, will determine the future for the next thousand. So all those people in this room and all anybody over the age of 20 and 18 who's about to enter the space, uh, it's a really daunting task and challenge in front of you all where you all have to take some action, right? Inaction will not do any longer. We are all part of uh, non-state actors. Uh, we are not the government, but whatever they decide impacts us. We are already seeing uh, you know, heat waves and uh, water stress. You are seeing a lot of plastic pollution. Anirban will obviously talk more on that. Uh, but within all of this, it's not a doom and gloom uh, scenario. There is obviously optimism. As long as UCR is there, there will always be optimism in the market. Uh, so briefly, I'll just highlight about our protocol. Your projects that you intend to submit to UCR as per the standard should be on or after Jan 1st, 2002. That is the first criteria for eligibility, right? So if you've commissioned your project in 2001, too bad, you will not be allowed to earn carbon credits. Number two is you have to look at what we have a positive list of approved project types and a negative list of approved project types, right? All this is there in the documentation, so please have a look at it. Uh, so if you're part of the approved project types, and typically an example of this would be wind, solar, hydro, biogas, biomass. Uh, we call them the plain vanilla projects in the carbon market. Uh, these are automatically approved for earning carbon credits. Uh, what is not allowed uh, right now is a forestation project. We don't take uh, you know, an energy efficient way of mining coal uh, because we firmly believe that we have to promote a path of defossilization and not just decarbonization. So we are on the path to break the addiction away from fossil fuels and more into renewables. And so our belief within this standard is that we must make it super, super, super profitable for those that are uh, you know, moving away from fossil fuels and installing wind, solar, and hydro projects. Um, earlier this morning, obviously, we had a lovely con call on the same. So our idea is that you set up your project and uh, earn an ROI much before time. So typically, if you were going to earn your ROI before, say, 10 years after you set up your project, using UCR carbon credits, you can then uh, you know, cut that time to down to two years and one year in some cases if it is a biogas project. Uh, so the idea is to build scale and fast, and that is what the latest IPCC report tells us to do. Uh, in fact, this was the first time that the IPCC report has been signed by 
many of almost all the countries right they were forced to sign so all their climate actions that you're going to see from countries and governments are going to be based on the ipcc report so i would urge you to at least look at the summary of the ipcc findings because within you know it's a 3000 page document i understand but within that you will obviously find so many opportunities for startups uh, and, and obviously the united nations has also you know commented on the report and it's very key what they have said is they have said everybody and everything all at once so we need all kinds of help uh, to avert 1.5 degrees in the next uh, 10 to 15 years we are not on track uh, to achieve that so whether you are getting into waste management whether you are getting into evs whether you are getting into charging of those evs whether you are getting into wind solar hybrid systems uh, we require such technologies and we require them to be deployed now and at scale so we need to double our capacity uh, briefly jan 1st 2002 is your first qualifying mark uh, your projects must be commissioned on or after that the earliest date that you can earn carbon credits is from the year 2013 right uh the answer to that is yes you can transfer old cdm provided they are part of the ucr positive list right like i said we do not give carbon credits to somebody mining coal but is saying that it is an energy efficient way of mining coal where he is capturing the methane that is allowed somewhere else we don't allow it so if it is an old cdm project that has not claimed carbon credits for the vintage period of 2013 14 or whatever the case may be technically you can earn carbon credits for the year 2013 all the way up to 2020 uh i'm sure it would have been covered in the earlier uh, discussion that carbon credits as you know are given for jan to december of the preceding year we only deal with ex post credits right not ex ante not not credits where you are estimating the credits to come 10 years down the line we are looking at carbon credits for what has happened for the year 2013 2014 so i'll give you one quick example and then you will understand what i'm talking about uh say you have a windmill or a wind farm and you have supplied green power to the grid right so how do you showcase your supply it would be via your meter readings right every there are there are two types of meters a joint meter and a check meter and these meter readings are obviously uh, taken by the state regulator so we know how much megawatts you have supplied to the grid in one year so based on that we know what the grid emission factor is also so ucr has a very straightforward simplified grid emission factor so you multiply the megawatt hours by the grid emission factor round it down to the nearest tenth and then uh, that's how you get your carbon credits for that year right so this is what is called real because your meter readings are real you cannot tamper with it it is illegal you will go to jail uh, the meter readings are taken by you and the government so there is no way that you can tamper with it uh, the meter readings have to be calibrated each year that to the government does for you if you are supplying to the grid you have a power purchase agreements in place so you can find out on what date it was commissioned remember the date jan 1st 2002 so if your project is commissioned in 2010 even then you will earn carbon credits only from 2013 onwards uh yes i mean uh, look at the project boundary is defined where you set up your project and who is the owner of the project right so the the guy putting the solar panels on your roof is not the owner of the project it is the place where it's uh, put up all right who is the owner of the project is eligible to earn carbon credits and obviously you can outsource it to your consultant so uh, if you are joining ucr as a project developer or consultant and aggregator as we call it or a, even a project owner you have to open what is called a sellers account now this is free we are it, uh, we are not charging anybody for opening an account we are not charging anybody for uh, uploading n number of projects we are one of the few standards and registries to do that uh, our fees are obviously we have to earn revenue somewhere we are not an ngo so our fees are 5% of all the carbon credits that you are going to claim for that whatever year right so if you say you are going to claim 100 carbon credits then we keep 5 carbon credits and we return 95 back to you at the time of final audit uh, the typical process uh, it's also mentioned in the powerpoint presentation or you can even visit the website the first thing is obviously you open your seller account 
uh, you upload those documents. All the templates are available on the website. Uh, if you need help, hire your consultant. We don't recommend who to hire. We have a list of auditors that are pre-approved. You have to hire any one of those 15. Remember, this is independent third-party audits, so we don't uh, interfere in the agreements or the fee structure between the auditors. You're free to hire and take quotes from any of the 15. Uh, they are the same auditors that are well-known in the market internationally also. They have done uh, um, many of these audits. Uh, we have stopped onboarding more auditors because it's just a flood of auditors. Now we are expanding into Africa and taking projects from there and Brazil, so we are onboarding specific auditors from those countries uh, so if anybody is asking about whether any more auditors for carbon no but we will be looking at auditors from the water credit industry water management water company but that is later uh, so stage number two is you open your account and then you start uploading what is called a project concept note the project concept note is essentially just describe your project tell us which method you're using make sure uh, this is one important thing. I hope people have uh, earlier highlighted this in the previous discussions that the method to do a project has already been defined by the United Nations. I repeat, the method to do any project, any project, renewable energy project or waste to energy project or a biofuel project or a uh, pet recycling project, uh, plastic recycling project, every method that is conceivable has already been uh, highlighted and demonstrated. Uh, if you go to the UNF Triple C CDM website, there are there are there is something called methodologies, and you can download those methodologies for free. It shows you how to calculate your carbon credits. It shows you what parameters UCR will look at, uh, what parameters the auditor looks at, what documents you require. So it is not rocket science. These methodologies, obviously, some say are good, some bad, but right now, these are the methodologies we have under the UN guidance, and these methodologies have been developed over the last 18 years. So sometimes you'll find a methodology version uh, number 18, right? So it has been changed 18 times or updated 18 times, uh, and you will find which projects can qualify. So if you are supplying renewable energy power to the grid, there is a methodology for that. If you're uh, not supplying to the grid, you're using it for captive consumption, there's a methodology for that. If you are producing biofuels from plantations as well as waste oil from the restaurant industry, which we are seeing right now coming to India, there is a methodology for that. So yes, please go, just, just go to Google, type UNF triple C, UNF CCC, uh, three times, uh, methodology CDM, right? So, just so you all know, in 2006 and 7, when I first started out, there was just something called the Clean Development Mechanism, right? This was what the only body that was issuing carbon credits, my time. So CDM is governed by the UN, and everything that the UN does obviously has the support of 190 nations. So the methodologies have been developed by a lot of experts. So... When you come to UCR, to you use, uh, yeah, and uh, Samrat, you can also add CDM methodologies. Uh, in that methodologies, there is something for large scale methodologies and small scale. So large scale, I would just briefly go through it. Large scale is anything over 15 megawatts installed combined capacity or 45 megawatts thermal. I know it's too technical, but just, just listen, just take it down. It is anything over 15 megawatts uh, that installed capacity goes by default into large scale. Anything under 15 megawatts becomes small scale. So there are different methodologies that you might need to select. So you will give us the project concept note in which you will state your project and the templates are available. If you face a problem, please look at over 300 projects have been registered on UCR till date. You can, I'm sure one of your projects is already been done by somebody or a similar type. You can obviously download their PC and then see how they are doing it. It's not rocket science. We have made it simple for a reason. Uh, after that, you submit a video. We have to see that uh, your project is currently operational, right? We, we are not giving you credits for something that stopped working 10 years ago. It has to be currently operational. So we will, uh, you will submit. We have made that also very simple. Uh, we, you have to submit and upload. We all like to take YouTube videos and TikTok videos. So 
just upload a one minute video of your uh, or a sample of what project uh, type it is show us the solar panels or show us a working wind farm um, you don't have to show all the wind farms i know there are many wind farms that you are going to aggregate but just show one typical wind farm we will know whether it is currently operational from your uh, meter readings uh, after that once you submit it to us uh, we will then review it and if it fits all the criteria as per the standard we will then issue you a registration number once your project is registered it will show up on the main website under the project registration list that this project can now go ahead for an independent audit and then you the client can contact any of the 15 auditors take their quote and start auditing again as per the methodology right which methodology you select um it is all specified what needs to be monitored so if it is something as simple as grid supply power then we all you have to look at is each month how much uh, meter uh, readings have you generated and we will come the auditor will technically compare it with the invoices obviously you are getting paid to supply to the grid uh, and the government won't pay you for uh, extra uh, megawatt hours that you supply so that is just one example i'm telling you there could be different there are like i said over 300 types of projects that you can do after that the auditor will give you his recommendation his uh, his finding for uh, you know based on the methodology your calculations come down to say uh, 100 carbon credits a year for this year but the auditor once he goes through your reports he'll find that the plant was shut down for onm or uh some things in the jmr don't match so he might give you 98 carbon credits so when there is a discrepancy like that we go by the auditor's report obviously we have to look at what the auditor says we don't look at what the owner says so think about it if you were in a court of law the owner is the defense and the auditor is the prosecutor right i'm not the judge um i'm just below the judge and if everything is okay we issue the credits into your account and we have tied up with uh, spot exchange for carbon trade exchange and then again it like i said there is no fee on transfer retirement you will see in the powerpoint presentation so we've given you a one click option if you feel like it you can trade on the uh, spot exchange if you want to engage say palomi comes to you and says i want to buy your credits for the climate collective clients in that case that is called an otc trade out over the counter trade so follow me would then contact you and then give you her ucr buyer account so by default remember it is like a stock market exchange right or it's a stock market nsdl so follow me has to open her account as a buy side so we have a buyer section where they open a free buyers account and then follow me and the climate collective will take control of those credits they will receive your credits and they will pay you outside the exchange and again we don't earn anything on this transaction we are being centralized uh you are free to send back and forth so over here obviously there is a risk whether climate collective pays first or whether the seller transfers the credit so that all risk is yours uh, or your profit is yours everything is yours you don't interfere our job is just to make sure that the credits are transferred between two parties and if uh, say the buyer retires the credits which is permanent removal then that also can be done free on the registry so typically buyers will retire credits for their footprint uh, as you know each one has their own carbon footprint it could be 1 ton it could be 10000 tons whatever the case may be so that is typically the working of a standard and a registry not all standards in the world have their own registry we are fortunate enough to have developed our own standard and our own registry so because we own the right to our own registry that we built from scratch we can technically tie up with almost anybody so uh, while the other standards and registries might not allow you to tokenize and use blockchain place for your credits we do we allow you free uh, we uh, let you take carbon credits live uh, not everybody take, allows you to take carbon credits live um and finally i'll come to water credits quickly uh, follow me i have time i hope i can have Five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Hey guys. All right. So now this is carbon credits, right? Uh, carbon credits as an incentive model, right? So I started with that, where set up the project and then earn carbon credits, right? The earlier thinking was 
on show us you require carbon credits to finance the project so we we don't believe that will uh, amount to a lot of scale and we have seen that is a very failed concept where uh, you give your carbon credits girvi right we put it uh, on hold and you sell it in forwards and then uh, you don't actually get the prices that you require carbon credits <laughs> obviously are not the the solution to climate change but because you're a polluter uh, who cannot set up their own expensive wind farm or a solar farm you are actually buying carbon credits as a you know environmental attribute from such a project and you can showcase it on your books as uh, you know net zero and you have uh, technically taken some kind of action for your carbon footprint uh, that is how it technically functions the voluntary carbon market like i said there is no gun to anybody's head you are free to choose where you want to go and submit your project and in the same way the polluter is free to choose whether he purchases the credits or not right there is no compulsion on him right now obviously there is a pressure pressure from on him for uh, the investors uh, you have pressure from the customers everybody is asking you to showcase your esg sdg showcase your credentials showcase that you're not a parasite showcase that you're not that you're a sustainable company right in a nutshell so this movement obviously has come out in the last two years uh, uh, when during covid obviously we were all at home and then we on our surroundings um, and so this movement actually took off uh, more in the last two years i would say and uh, that is why you know we today we don't need to explain to people what is carbon credit what is uh, carbon offset uh, as long as there is talk about a cross border tax in the team so just know this that the voluntary carbon up to over 800 billion dollars a year market cap so uh governments obviously play in that market and in this market it is the sme it is the medium to small industries it is somebody whose footprint is between 50000 to 100000 to 200000 tons the other market which the government controls there the typical footprint of a polluter is 1 million 5 million 10 million tons right so the price is also higher it is managed by them they don't play in this market and obviously this market doesn't play with that market. so uh we are part ucr is part of the voluntary carbon market which is expected to grow prices here will always be between 1 dollar to 5 dollar simply because remember your target audience the buyer at the end of the day is a small and medium enterprise whose footprint is hardly 10000 20000 50000 100000 tons a year so he is not going to buy a permit from the government at 100 dollars he is coming to you for a reason yes you will call it it green washing wagera wagera but bottom line is that whether it is green washing whether it is green hushing that entity is taking voluntary action there is no compulsion on him to reduce his footprint but that they are doing it is good enough because like the un says some action is better than no action you cannot take any action in today's time so that is carbon credits in the same way we have launched the world's first voluntary water credits program now this is not related to entitlement trading you can google what entitlement trading is this is not related to say a buyer using only 4 uh, 4 liters of water a day as opposed to somebody using 10 liters water a day we are not playing the you know the carbon, uh, water offsetting game here we are playing what is called uh, something devoted to water conservation water management excuse me kishor we are uh, losing you could you just repeat uh, we just lost the person <coughs> yeah the water credit right Yeah, 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 yeah. Just okay, like okay. like thirty seconds of it, last thirty seconds. Okay, okay. So, uh, so everybody, water credits is a very new concept. We are giving you water credits for not water purification projects. Of course, that is also there, but mainly for rainwater harvesting projects, for water recycling and recharge projects, groundwater, for uh, reuse and gainful end use. right you can't just reach a pretty or water in the ecp ecp and then discharge it into the drain we would like you to reuse it in your uh, you know say for landscaping or for your uh, 
uh, washroom purposes that many of the clients are doing. So what this does is we are trying to incentivize people to conserve water through the sale of water credits. And our two pilot projects that we have done, one was a residential rainwater harvesting project where the water went to a local well. And the other project was a much larger project from uh, Karnataka where they had uh, built, uh, the owners had built a large catchment because their wells were going running dry. And so they monetized their water credits from 2015 to 2021. Uh, earlier, they would have to go to crowdfunding sites or go to a company and ask for CSR funds. But not anymore. We are very happy that they sold these credits. Uh, I think the range was anywhere with, uh, because like I said, we are not part of the transaction, but we, were, we found out that they sold 1,000 liters for uh, 15 rupees each, 15 or 10 to 15 rupees each. And so they monetized all the credits from, water credits from 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And they made enough money to now not go out and ask for CSR funds. So now they are going ahead and building more catchments and more uh, recharge wells in their area. So that is the whole idea where you can monetize the past to build future climate resilience, right? You can monetize the past to build future climate resilience without the recourse to, you know, begging or going on crowdfunding sites and then asking that, I need to build a well, please send me some water, I mean, please send me some cash. So we are making you Atma Nirbhar in that sense where you show us what you've done in the past, monetize that and then go into the future. So that is what the water credit program is. Uh, it is, again, you go to the website, it is under the vertical called ROU or Rainwater Offset Unit. Um, we give you one water credit for every thousand liters that you conserve. Uh, just like carbon credits, you can have a look at and because it's so new, there are no methods. We have developed our own methods looking at the uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Standards and we have looked at uh, what are the best practices. And it's pretty simple. Uh, if it is a runoff area, then all the formulas are also mentioned over there. Have a look at it. And again, you can earn water credits from the year 2014 onwards. But unlike carbon credits, there is no start date. The reason is, we want you to go and revive all the old projects that have been abandoned in the past, right? We've had step wells, we've had the Purana, you know, you would have gone to old castles and old Maharaja type sites where they've had those wells in front that have been abandoned. Or you go to a tribal area and they have their own small, small wells that they've dug. Or if you go down, they're getting new projects from Gujarat where they are building these small uh, catchment areas using plastic uh, liners. So all these projects will be eligible for water credits. Uh, 1,000 liters is equal to one water credit. Uh, the maximum you can earn is obviously uh, 1 million water credits. Uh, it's, yeah, all right. Thanks, Barbie. Uh, all right. Uh, so that was the water credit program. Uh, plastic credits, obviously, Anirban will uh, take care of that. But we are also coming out with something called SDG credits. Now, for those who don't know what SDG is, please Google it. Again, it is part of the UN. Uh, the United Nations has, defi has defined what an SDG is, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals. So if you are an entrepreneur, you have 17 different uh, sub-sectors that you can enter, right? Whether it is if you are into eradicating poverty, whether it is clean water and sanitation, whether it is uh, promoting life on land, life below water. So you know, life below water would typically be, you know, you're trying to save the coral reefs all the way to saving plastic in the ocean. All that is covered. Um, we are getting a great project from uh, Italy where they are showcasing uh, using tidal movements, how they can improve the water quality of lagoons in Italy. So these are the kinds of projects that you come across. But SDG credits in a nutshell, just uh, I guess we'll be the first in the world to introduce this. We are, again, uh, giving you credits for doing good, number one, right? So I'll give you one example of what an SDG credit is. You might ask, later on, there'll be a question, I'm sure, who will you sell it to? But uh, that is also covered in one of the slides. So what is an SDG credit, right? There are 17 different subsectors within the SDG market. If you can Google SDG credits uh, or SDG UN, you will see the 17 different uh, uh, subsectors or uh, goals that they've mentioned, right? So if you're into climate action, if you're into climate change, 
if you are an entrepreneur you will find your calling in one of these 17 surely carbon credits water credits are also part of this they come under climate action uh please have a look at it read it so within that i will give you one example of what we will be launching so say uh you go out and uh, look after animals right uh, or injured animals so you set up your own shelter obviously you go out and ask for some funding or uh, you get a csr person to help you out but you set up a shelter where you are looking after uh, dogs cats or any injured animal so what we are going to come out with is a system where you can obviously uh, quantify how many animals you've saved from say 2013 onwards right and we'll give you an sdg credit for all the work that you've done from 2013 to 2022 or uh, number of animals that you've saved number of uh, animals that you've rehabilitated and this would come under the sdg of you know life on earth which is there uh, improving the sustainability of mega cities i'm just giving you a simple example because it can go into the really really crucial stuff into you know you can get into child trafficking you can get into uh, prevention of prostitution you can then get into abandoned senior citizens and so on and so forth so that is what we are aiming for and uh, we are what we have to do is who's going to buy these right because they have to be priced higher than carbon and water so there is an interesting concept coming out uh, within this next six months you will see the launch of many new marketplaces where they will be converting these tokens as we say sdg water carbon into something like a investment token right so these tokens may go up by a certain percentage i am not i repeat legally i cannot uh, divulge much but uh, i am not an investment banker neither am i a certified financial planner so i can only tell you who's asking for what and so they have asked us to design something around animal something लाइफाइम okay i think unfortunately we lost kishor maybe due to internet issues um zoe can we move on to plastic credits um yes i think he was anyway just okay he's back hi kishor um we lost you okay uh, i think he was wrapping up and anyway we are out of time uh, so yeah 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 jimmy i'm done thanks uh, over to oh, you okay 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 great um uh, all right um we can move on to plastic credits and hand it over to anil bhai yeah thanks thanks joey thanks uh, kishor and follow me i'll start sharing my screen and please if you could confirm this is visible yeah yeah it's visible all right so uh, good evening everyone um Uh, my name is anirban chatterjee and i am uh, representing rti international we are an independent not profit research institute uh, using the power of science for uh, solving some of the most critical social uh, and developmental challenges that the world is facing we started uh, our operations around some 60 years back as a, as a group of uh, uh individuals coming in from three universities uh, based in north carolina one was uh, the dukes uh, one is the state university of north carolina and then the university on chapel hill and i think the the underlying agenda of of this particular collaboration was to really uh, use the power of science use the power of evidence to to really deliver value which is not um 
uh, a stop cap arrangement, but something there in the uh, long run in, in a sustainable way. So we usually work largely with donor based organizations uh, like uh, the USAID, uh, the Australian aid, we work with foundations, we work with governments and we work with the private sector. And what we try to do is try to see what and where the problem exists, what could be the potential solutions to it, and, and then try to address those solutions. Um, a brief about us as an organization, not many of you may have heard about RTI. Uh, at least in India, RTI means right to information, which doesn't always draw a very strong uh, reaction. Uh, a positive reaction, but uh, RTI stands for Research Triangle Institute. I think the right side of the screen really covers what we are very proud of as an organization, our, our research bent, our scientific stature, our contribution to science, our uh, number of patents every year, the journals, the book chapters that we really publish. So that's, that's the kind of organization that we are. Sustainable development is at the core of our capabilities and our intent. We are present across uh, you know, different horizons, whether it is innovations and discovery sciences, we create our own IP, uh, we, we sell those IP and we monetize them. Uh, we work in the area of education and skilling in energy systems. Uh, in India, for example, we are developing or and implementing the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership Program for USAID. It's a, it's a five-year program, and we are trying to uh, develop a common hub for the entire South Asia region from an electricity and energy perspective. We uh, work in the area of food security and agriculture. We work in the area of society and justice in terms of equalities. We try to even fight for rights of, of uh, criminals and convicts uh, based on uh, the different international conventions. We are very strong on environment and climate change. That's one of the areas that we focus on. Uh, health practices and finally resource efficiency and circularity. I, I, have, uh, I, I come from this particular team which focuses on that and the plastic credits is, is all about the emerging topic on circularity and resource efficiency that India is currently uh, really picking up a lot under the EPR scheme. Um, across the life cycle of a program, I, I think we are present everywhere, whether it is visioning about what is going to happen, helping our clients forecast how things are going to change. For example, when it comes to EPR, one of the things that we try to provide uh, is or, or assist or guide our client is how has circularity as a concept emerged in other nations because often history repeats itself. So we try to do those mega trend analysis, those future foresighting to help forecast uh, to generate those early intelligence as to what uh, and where is uh, the you know water the, the the future is flowing into. Based on that early intelligence, we help our clients plan uh, uh, the various risks that their businesses may face, the action plan, the strategy. We are very fo focused on technology and solution scouting. Uh, we, we developed our own technology. We also help uh, develop research uh, based papers. We help connect uh, and build partnerships between various stakeholders in a particular sector. Once, once the plan, once the overall framework is in place, we help in implementing the solutions for the client wherein, wherein we bring in those partnerships, those collaborations between various organizations. Uh, uh, and, and, and we also help in innovative financing, blended financing. That's something that we do a lot. And finally, once the project has been implemented, we focus a lot on sustaining that, that not only means monitoring and evaluating, but something we like to call as Marla, which is more about learning what the project has been delivering, whether it's going on the right track or not, and then learning from the good and the bad things, and then kind of restructuring and reevaluating our strategy. So that's pretty much on a life cycle basis, the kind of work that we do. I'm, I'm really, really very grateful to Climate Collective for um, uh, having me here to uh, share uh, the, the, about the plastic 
uh, credits. It's it's really a market based mechanism, something very similar to carbon credits. And and I think this with with the emergence of a lot of EPR and circularity. In fact, mission life, uh, something which our prime minister focuses on a lot talks about circularity, how India can really save 14 lakh crores by 2030 if we move from a use and throw economy to a more of circular economy, right? So I think um, you know you, you need these mechanisms and, and that's, that's, that's what this particular session is all about. So with this, with this advent of uh, the, the EPR, you know, uh, the potential for business in this in the space of plastic waste collection and recycling is is really growing at an unprecedented uh, pace. There is uh, there is significant white space, I believe, for new businesses and startups uh, to address the demand for recycling uh, and and for uh, you know sharing recycled content with with brand owners because uh, a lot of them are trying to remove the use of virgin material from their uh, packaging supply chains. However, like any other business, this recycling business also comes with its own risk, right? And, and that's where market-based mechanisms are really, really required to act as potential risk offsetting opportunities for, for these businesses. Now, uh, when, when you talk of market-based mechanisms, one of the most common ones known are uh, the cap and trade mechanisms. Um, I'm, I've changed my slide. Can uh, anyone please confirm if if the slides are visible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the sale okay. of carbon plastic credits is the yes. slide. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so one of the more widely known market-based mechanisms it is, is this cap and trade mechanism. Now, what happens in a cap and trade mechanism? Um, you, you, you put an impact cap or a threshold on on entities, and entities performing better than that. Uh, they earn credits, entities who are unable to meet that cap, uh, they, they kind of to purchase those credits to, to offset the debit or the net debit that they had. In the parlance of, uh, in the parlance of carbon market, you have the emitters and then you have those low carbon or carbon avoidance projects, which, which are something, uh, those renewable energy projects, which are carbon offsetting in nature. So those kind of projects earn uh, credits and then they sell it to it to those emitters who who have a huge uh, uh, you know carbon inventory that they really need to bring to net zero right so so that's the that's the difference that's get created in a cap and trade mechanism a uh, very similar thing what kishore spoke on an sdg mechanism right you you are trying to look at an impact baseline anyone who is better than that baseline earns credits Anyone who is not that great has to purchase those credit. The plastic uh, credit is is something uh, very similar. So so entities who are uh, engaged in the business of managing the plastic waste that is out there, right? The recyclers, the collectors, they would end up earning the plastic credits, and they would have the opportunity to sell those plastic credits to those entities who are putting it out there in the market, right? So that would include your brand owners, your manufacturers who are really using plastic material for their packaging. Everything that we use and buy today has a plastic packaging, right? So those are the entities who are creating a net debit on the environment uh, in form of the plastic waste that gets eventually generated from using their products. And these recyclers and collectors are helping managing, uh, kind of trying to reduce the impact that that plastic packaging waste is creating on that environment. And hence they earn those credits and that's how the real transaction happens. Um, now something, I'm, I'm sure this must have been covered in the earlier session on carbon credits, but very similar, even plastic trading happens on two markets. You have a spot market, you have a forward market. So in the spot market, what happens is based on the amount of uh, plastics that you have actually recycled as a recycler, you earn credits and you sell uh, those particular credits. Now, when you do that ex post, like after your operations are over, usually those credits would help you to manage your operational expenditure. 
Um, of course, that is not the challenge that every recycler or agency faces. Some agency may face a challenge of high capital cost, which they don't have. In such case, such agencies usually adopt uh, a, a forward contract in which the potential uh, plastic credits, uh, which their project is likely to generate, that gets sold upfront to a credit purchaser um, and, and against, against a consideration against a fee. And, and that fee actually helps them in overcoming excessive uh, uh, you know, capital expenditure, which might be required. So depending on uh, the situation, a particular program, a particular project developer is in, they may choose to adopt a, a forward contract or a spot contract. This is very, very similar to your carbon uh, credits and transaction processes. I think Kishore can explain this much better, but 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 that's that's very similar that it happens uh, in in the plastic credits now now let me take an example of how plastic credits can really help a particular organization now we have been speaking with uh, many particular agencies uh, and and one of the chief challenges um, recyclers face you know is the fragility of the supply chain and and this really uh, happens because uh, the the supply chain of plastics today are dependent on those informal waste collectors, right? Who the, the rack pickers, the safai sathis, um, we may call them different names, but the end uh, uh, situation these people face is while they toil day in and day out to, to collect the plastics, different form of plastic, sort them and send them to the recyclers. Very often they are not able to make their ends meet, right? Uh, they have uh, challenges on the financial side, they have social stigma, so on and so forth. And, and what it does is it inhibits the long-term intent of staying in this business. And, and if your supply chain is pretty much uh, very volatile in nature, your business uh, becomes uh, uh, on, on uh, very fluid waters, right? Um, it will become very difficult to raise finance as a business. So uh, in, in, in such a situation, if you had those additional revenues coming in from plastic credits, you could extend a portion or, or uh, a, a, a significant portion of those revenues onto these uh, you know, waste pickers to, to give them uh, some form of equitable value to the effort that they're putting, some form of fair uh, compensation, which, which can really motivate um, uh, these uh, waste pickers, waste collectors to stay engaged in the business, to understand the value that this business is providing to them. And, and that is one way you could, you know, kind of stabilize your, your supply chain. Thinking or uh, taking this uh, uh, idea forward, uh, whenever um, their peers observe that, hey, this particular guy is involved in, in uh, the supply chain of a particular agency and, and this guy is paying, getting paid more uh, because uh, the, the agency is leveraging the plastic credits. The word of mouth is a very, very strong um, attraction for other IWCs, for other informal waste collectors to also get engaged with that business. And so we are talking not only about um, stabilizing your supply chain, we are also talking about um, enhancing the volume of uh, the plastics that you have now access to. So the greater the, uh, the, the greater the volumes you can capture, the more you can think about expanding your facility. And that's how you enter into a growth market, right? So this is one practical example of how um, uh, revenues from sale of credits coming from this cap and trade mechanism can help you in your business. Of course, um, there can be different barriers for different recyclers uh, and collection agencies, and, and we can leverage this additional finances for solving those problems. This was just one example, right? Um, now, when we talk about the plastic credit ecosystem, uh, it works through several, several plastic credit programs. Um, Kishore just mentioned back back in 2007 when he had, when he had started there was only CDM right but then a number of voluntary programs picked up I think plastic because of the significant focus it is receiving the world over um, the challenges that plastic um, creates once it reaches the ocean 
uh, the to the marine economy is is really disastrous, and that's why given uh, the the intent and the importance that plastic waste is being provided today, a lot of programs are coming up. While uh, I would say um, there are several, it's the differentiation between this program is very subtle. Okay, some of them are uh, more supply driven. Some of like supply when I say supply driven, it's 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 focusing more on the generators of the plastic credits, and some of them are more demand driven. So people who would want to buy those plastic credits, the difference is very subtle. Um, I I don't want to draw a very uh, dark red line uh, between the two. It's a very subtle uh, difference because ultimately all of these programs are trying to create this marketplace such that plastic collection and recycling as an activity really picks up okay so but but if i have to still um, explain the difference so supply driven programs are those uh, which uh, create and maintain a defined set of procedures for recyclers and waste management businesses for registering their projects and they get issued uh, those credits so for example if i just uh, draw uh, uh, and uh, uh, a similarity with uh, the, the UCR program, which Kishore mentioned. So Kishore, from a carbon credit perspective, they man maintain a standard following which a project can get registered and those projects can earn those credits, right? So similarly, supply-driven programs are those, and I have given some example here like uh, Vera and so on and so forth. So they are maintaining those standards for uh, plastic credits. And, and if a project is registered, they adhere to the standards and the protocols, the credits are issued to them. And brands, whoever uh, are, are, are you know, creating those uh, packaging uh, material, they can purchase those credits from them, okay? Um, there are also demand-driven programs, okay? Um, there is, let me, why demand-driven programs have come? Because um, I think there is a very, very, very much eagerness amongst the brands, amongst the packaging companies to offset the amount of plastic waste that they are putting out in the market. Investors are really looking at ESG performance uh, these days for various companies, and this is something on top of that. So brands, they need really turnkey solution. They need to understand, okay, what's my plastic footprint? of sorts, how much tons of plastics am I putting out there in a year? Um, uh, then then where, what are the potential programs from which I can purchase credits from? Um, uh, at what price can I uh, purchase it from? Uh, once I've purchased, what is the format in which I can put out that I am plastic neutral? Uh, you know, you have net zero in carbon. So similarly, I am plastic neutral in nature. So, so, so there are also, I would say, uh, a lot of needs from a brand perspective and the, um, and the demand driven plastic programs, which I have listed over here, they, they focus on the needs of the brand more. Right, some of this example like Impact Plus by Ocean Works, Plastic Collective, Plastic Credit Exchange. So these are are those side of programs. Now taking an example of Vera, okay, and and I could have taken everyone, but but this is just an example. Now now Vera is a supply driven program, right? So it is open for informal and formal plastic waste collection agencies and for infrastructure development on plastic waste recycling, right? So it's collection and recycling. Currently, reduce, refill, reuse activities are not covered under their plastic uh, program protocol. Uh, it's been around for, I would say like a year, a bit more than a year or about a year, and almost 20 projects have already applied for, for this particular program. Two of them have already got registered. One is uh, Recycle Indonesia, um, and, and the other is uh, Second Life Thailand. Um, uh, so, so Second Life has already gone ahead and started selling those uh, plastic credits. So they entered uh, into a contract with uh, Cordely, which is um, a French skincare company, and, and they are selling it almost at 500 euros uh, credit uh, 
uh, and here one credit incidentally like you have a ton carbon dioxide in carbon credit so one plastic credit is a ton of plastic recycled in their case and so you will see different types of credits in vera so you have a wcc which is a waste collection credit and you have a wrc which is a waste recycling credit so so that's that's how uh, it is um, similar to carbon credits there are tests of additionality and common practice which are also uh, introduced over here i won't go into what those mean i'm sure that's already covered in a different session but but just to share a very bird's eye view as to what what this looks like um i, I did a very basic kind of um assessment uh, see because uh, under under the the unfccc carbon credit methodologies there are methodologies where you can earn carbon credits for recycling of uh, plastic glass metal etc so typically a recycling project uh, can can right there is a possibility it can both uh, it can earn both plastic credits as well as carbon credits so that was one of the questions i think kavita you you asked that uh, so so for a 10000 tons per annum plastic recycling facility i did some very very high level ballpark numbers and i think there are significant financial benefits to gain payback periods a year at best so 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 that's that's the kind of um uh, benefits that you uh, can uh, hope to leverage if if uh, you you try to enter this particular market um that being said um plastic credits is not the only mechanism around okay many brands uh, i have given a few examples here they instead of offsetting their plastic footprint by purchasing credits uh, they are really keen to source plastic right uh, for product manufacturing so you have adidas who are uh, uh, making their boots their shoes with recycled content um kia motors signed an mou with uh, the ocean cleanup program to purchase at arms length okay not any concessional prices but at arms length the ocean based plastic so so the ocean cleanup program as the name suggests they do a lot of cleanup programs not only at the beach side cleanup which we are all very familiar with but also mid ocean plastic which gets collected in the vortices uh, across the various uh, uh, oceans so they collect all this plastic waste and kia motors actually purchases uh, fixed quantities because they use it to create a whole lot of um uh, you know items for their for the cars they manufacture it goes for the uh, overall fabric it goes in the development of the dashboards uh, the coverings so on and so forth right even logitech has launched its product series uh, which includes more than 50% recycled content right so it's across sectors uh, it's across business division that this is picking up so you if if you if you feel that plastic credits is not really uh, the uh, the area you want to enter into there are believe me it's not the end of the world there are a lot of brands who are really keen to purchase the uh plastic material the waste plastic material that that you are collecting or recycling now one very interesting thing on this particular side if you if you look at the logitech ad uh at the branding top right there is a certification logo right and that brings me to a very important point when it comes to plastic credit um and that is data and traceability brands are extremely conscious about the plastic waste that they purchase for example uh, some brands want to ensure that the plastic that they are collecting is really post consumer okay it's it's not that someone just picked plastic from somewhere and and handing it over to them some brands are extremely conscious that only the ocean based plastic is what they want to collect they just they just don't want any other plastic right now this is not easy to certify especially in south asia and other countries where data is extremely scarce so this is where the role of certification standards coming in again there are tons of certification standards out there which primarily focus on traceability and documentation of the source of plastic 
Now, for ex uh, now, now this incidentally opens up another uh, business opportunity on data science. Uh, and you know, if if some entrepreneurs are out here who in, are in this business, this would be of interest to you. So you have Circularize. Uh, which is a leading software platform which provides end-to-end -end traceability okay, of the material right from where it got collected with, with video evidence to the recycler, to the logistics, to the ship, right up to the manufacturing facility of the brand. So, so there is a demand for uh, these kind of uh, solutions. They use a lot of visual-based AI to really ensure whatever is ultimately reaching the shop floor is actually recycled plastics so so that's that's something that um, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, work going on again uh, plastic credits registries are coming up they are getting developed by all the uh, programs which i mentioned in the previous slide the demand side and the supply side oriented programs um, there is a lot of blockchain that's uh, that's getting utilized in these registries. Again, Kishore can explain that further. And, and so that's a very high level view of where we stand on the plastic credit. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, follow me over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anirban. It was a really informative presentation. And uh, we know that these are uh, complex subjects and as well, there are a lot of lot to know, and we really feel that a one hour session is less. Uh, so, but we are about time. So we'll take a few questions, but before the questions, I would ask Tejas to launch the uh, polls. We have few more questions, like one answer type. So uh, basically uh, we'll, have, we'll ask you, we are asking you that if you have faced any challenges while working in the carbon markets, uh, because we understand that uh, it's a difficult space to navigate. Uh, so if you can answer that question, Tejas, it's okay if we, uh, after this, we can launch the other polls as well, uh, like while we are taking the queries. So I'll just uh, directly jump over to the question and answers. I know uh, we have answered already a lot of questions. I can see a lot of answered questions here, but uh, uh, some of the questions have been repeated. And so that I would just want uh, Kishore and Arimban to take uh, these questions. So uh, we have questions on carbon pricing. So uh, some of our identities are asking uh, that carbon credits have different prices uh, in different situations. For example, offsetting the same amount of carbon would have different prices. So why would a company pay more for the same offset? If uh, Kishore, you can take this up. Yeah, that that's a good question. So uh, this 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 question directly is what I also tell most of the clients that why would a company pay more? Uh, bottom line is everybody wants to do the uh, most cheapest option. Remember, the voluntary carbon market does is not unlike it's very different from the compliance market, right? The compliance market is where the government sets the price, where you have to uh, you know go in for an auction of those permits. But in the voluntary carbon market, one to five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, it all depends on how you market the project. It all depends on uh, what kind of additional uh, social benefits are there to the project. Uh, typically, for renewable energy projects, anywhere from one dollar to five dollars is the uh, going rate. It has been the going rate for the last twenty years, and it is a very good question because yeah, in the voluntary market, you know, there is no gun to anybody's head. They're doing this on their voluntary basis for showcasing sustainability and for a small and medium enterprise they will obviously go for the most cheapest option and if you were a business that is what you would be also expected to do you wouldn't go for the most expensive play around uh, that said you know there is something called the cross-border carbon tax coming uh, in europe and you'll you'll be if you're an exporter then you better watch out uh, if you're trying to buy cheap credits you might have to buy very expensive cross-border adjustment mechanism uh, certificates issued. Kishore, you are breaking up. Uh, you can switch off the video and continue. Yeah, in case of internet issues. Yeah, so is this better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
ठीक है सो या वन टू फाइव डॉलर इज द नॉर्म फॉर टिपिकल प्लेन रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी प्रोजेक्ट एज यू गो okay i think we might have lost him can others hear no, no i can no. hear you follow me so like yeah lost all right so yeah kish sure i think uh, we had lost you in the bit in between uh we should we move forward with the other questions yeah 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 okay okay so continuing on the uh, pricing uh some some of our attendees want to know uh how is tokenization based on carbon credits uh how do carbon credits firms earn and if you can give an idea about the broker charges in the current market you sure uh we yeah. so uh typically it varies broker will charge you anywhere you know between 5 to 30% uh depending on the number of uh, credits that you are offering uh in terms of tokenization obviously this is uh, this is very new to the market in the last two years we have seen a lot of token plays uh what they typically do is uh they take ucr credits we are the world's first registry to introduce something called the burn and tokenize option so you can onboard live carbon credits onboard live water credits onto your chain it is the tokenizer's responsibility then to retire the credits on chain so typically they do this by having a burn address or what is called a zero wallet address uh and obviously the kind of metadata that they extract from each carbon credit remember the carbon credit is not a paper certificate it is actually a digital certificate so within that digital certificate there is a lot of uh, metadata that you can extract such as project id uh which registry it's from what is the serial number of the credit which vintage year smart contract and then puts it on chain uh, some of the innovative uh, token companies even go to the extent of splitting or fractionalizing the carbon credits remember a carbon credit is 1000 kilos or 1 ton so you can actually fractionalize these tokens into 10 10 kilos 100 kilos where do you use it who buys it you can attach it to uh, blockchain plays of supply chain and product companies so these are some of the innovative uh, things that are coming out in the market where since all the end buyers and their supply chains are going on chain and by on chain i mean on blockchain uh, you can technically uh, negate the carbon footprint the water footprint or any of such utility plays that you are coming up with at the product level so you can go down to 10 kilos instead of one ton so that is one of the advantages of using blockchain and fractionalizing it you can take carbon credits and water credits i know in the metaverse where uh, there are companies that are also experimenting with you know uh, if you recycle then you will get a certain carbon credit um, there's also a play to earn model there's a game fi model coming there's an urban mobility play where if you book uh, evs for your rides or if you book sustainable transport you will get re- uh, rewarded with such carbon and water tokens so uh as a registry obviously we we are only concerned that you do not create uh, cryptocurrencies out of these uh, tokens because that is illegal in india so as long as you are creating carbon fungible tokens or non fungible tokens uh, we are we are here to support you um, through the burn and tokenize function where you will take the credits live without retiring it but full traceability is showcased on the registry of who's done what on which date and what time and on which token uh, blockchain token play you can watch uh, further action on these credits great thanks uh, kishore uh, we would take the last question because we are running out of time so this is for uh, anirban uh, so anirban one of our attendees is asking that can can someone generate plastic credits if they are using some other material uh, other than plastic Uh, like incentivizing them is that a possibility yeah i i did not quite follow the question uh, polomi i i actually replied on screen if if it could be elaborated by whosoever asked that question it was sent anonymously uh what is meant uh, by using something other than plastic mean i i did not quite follow that uh, okay uh 
whoever had this question can you just okay ah okay so metal and yeah. paper uh, uh, no not 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 now uh, your gay it's it's only meant for plastics uh, at this point of time the focus is a lot on plastics because uh, one would assume paper is more biodegradable in nature so so focus is a lot on plastics metals i think the recyclability among metals is very high compared to what we are seeing in plastics today and and so i think the world over they they want to focus on the problem at hand uh, i hope that answers your question right uh, so will uh, tejas uh, you can go ahead and launch the last poll uh, i know we are uh, running a little short of time but uh, we have received uh, overwhelming interest uh, regarding climate collectives programs and uh, uh, our new launches so yes we would be sharing uh, all the links that we have posted on chat over mail to each of you and uh, the workshop ppt uh, as well as uh, the recording of the session and we'll also share uh, the credentials of the speakers if that's not an issue so that uh, anirban kishore yeah well, let me just one uh, question can we also ask a poll question if if the understanding on plastic markets was helpful uh, it's just carbon markets as of now but but in case there are any question would uh, would be grateful if you could reach out to me uh, paul me has my coordinates of course thanks yeah 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 i'll i'll also share the coordinates due, uh, on the mail itself so you can personally reach out to kishore or anirban for any kind of queries or collaborations uh tejas you can go ahead uh, with the poll and uh, zui if you feel you can just we can just wrap up now yeah you can close this session right uh, no thanks uh, i know that we are well beyond time uh, so thanks everybody for staying back for the session and making this session so interactive um, uh, we we always have a lot of queries for these sessions and many times uh, we're not able to answer each and every query uh so as we mentioned we'll be sharing the coordinates of the speakers or you can get in touch with us as well and we can follow uh, we can forward your queries to be answered um uh, for um, an anirban like when uh, if you want um, you know a feedback on if the session was helpful we're happy to kind of send across on email to all of the attendees um, and get feedback for the same as well um, sure sure that's fine um great uh, no thanks everybody uh, thanks both kishore and anirban um we uh, hope that we can continue to spread awareness about all of these different markets even beyond carbon markets um uh, and uh, i mean i i especially keep getting emails from all of our startups of, uh, about plastic credits and other credits uh, so um, we we'll just uh, forward these to you um, and connect you uh, to them in the future uh, so thank you so much and thanks everybody please please feel free to connect to us for any further queries thank you thank you thank you bye thank you thank, thank you, you bye bye